Okay, great. Well, this uh, is a talk just all about masterful facilitation. Now, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to be using my iPad. So uh, I'll be annotating and drawing along. Uh, feel free to take screenshots whenever you want. But really, what this is all about is trying to get a better workshop results by sequencing and structuring your workshops for impact. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of a bird's eye view, and you're going to get some key tools that you can use straight away. We only have 45 minutes, and there's so much more I can go into. So if you're more than welcome to get in touch with me afterwards to go into more detail about any of the things that we cover. But just a quick thing about me. So um, a little bit of background. I'm PED. I run a learning and development consultancy called The Skills Lab. I started... Um, Oh, is my, my screen's not showing properly? Pub, can everyone see a picture of me? Oh, it's, now it's better, but yeah, it was like, it, it was, low, I didn't even notice it, but it was cut off, yeah. Oh, it was cut, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm like moving my slides like this. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, so um, I started uh, my uh, professional, my adulthood as a theoretical physicist, but uh, soon after leaving university, I've been creating learning experiences, workshops, programs, in some shape or form for 20 or so years. I put on workshops that are centered around skill development, leadership development, team development, organizational development, and as part of service design consultancies. And I've worked in a range of organizations in the public, private, uh, education and charity sectors. This is a selection of some of the more well-known clients that I've worked with. And what I'm gonna do in this talk is show you the exact process, the uh, approach that I use and some key tools to design and facilitate the workshops for these clients. Hey, Pat, and to interrupt. It seems like uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the screen is still uh, truncated. Uh, like the right side of the screen. Yeah, now we can see it perfectly, yeah. So I don't know, maybe when you go to a new slide, it... Uh... Yeah, 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 no, no, that's, uh, let me, do you know what, it's a new thing that I'm trying. What about, uh, is that still okay? Yeah, it was fine just before. Yeah. Maybe just try going to the next slide and see if it happens again. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, okay, so... cool. All right, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that, we made it work. And yeah, keep telling me if it's not working. All do. Um, all right, so... There's also the same stuff that I share with other coaches and consultants in a workshop design mastery program that I run to help people better position, design, and facilitate their workshops. So having said all of that, um, I know that these are some of the challenges that either I have experienced myself or I know other people's experience too. So we might waste quite a lot of time agonizing about what goes in and doesn't go into our workshops. Sometimes we work hard in our sessions because either people get lost about what they're doing and why they're doing it, or my kind of big fear is that people show up to a workshop looking disengaged and uh, looking like they'd rather be somewhere else, and you're working really hard to try to win them over. And this could lead to you're not feeling fully present in the workshop. Uh, your mind isn't on what's going on and what's happening with everyone and ultimately leading to some of these like hit and miss results. You know, sometimes you have some great workshops, they're amazing, you get good feedback. Other times you think, mm, it could have gone a little bit better. And of course, there's something which I haven't put on this list, but there's something that I know that I can sometimes experience and others do as well our old friend, imposter syndrome. So these are some of the challenges and I'm kind of curious in the chat, uh, just put a one, two, three or a four uh, to share which one of these like resonates with you the most. Just kind of getting a, a sense of it. Yeah, one, four, one and four, okay. I've got a three, there's a two. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for sharing and your honesty. So a bit of a mixed bag including four. <laughs> um, and so here, if these are the challenges, then the opportunities. 
The opportunity here is to save time and energy when, it's, when we're designing workshops. Also, we want to wow people with energizing experiences. And ultimately, we want to have this a consistent way of having impact so that we can also just feel very confident in our design and in our facilitation. So what is it that kind of gets in the way then, right? These are some of the mistakes that I've encountered, like I said, myself, and I've seen other people uh, come across too. So the first thing here is solely relying on our intuition, our enthusiasm, or just being good with people as our kind of main way to get through a workshop. Now, I'm not saying these are bad, they're actually quite good, but they can only take you so far. And it's not always stress-free or sustainable. The other thing that I see is that we might take a transactional approach to our workshops uh, and not realizing that what we're actually doing is taking people on a journey. We're taking them from somewhere to somewhere else. That's the difference between being transactional and just getting on with business, just get on with this, let's create that, versus that transformation of let's go on that journey together. And then this last thing here, the curse of knowledge, I don't know if you've come across this. This is a cognitive bias where we assume that other people have the same background knowledge that we've got in our own heads. And we find it subconsciously hard to understand that other people don't get what we know. So the way this works, the, the way this sort of manifests itself in a workshop is that we might not set up instructions clearly enough, or we might not take the necessary time or steps to guide people to their kind of insights and their aha moments. So having shared all of that, what I wanna do in this talk is really delve into a few things that are gonna help you uh, just design your workshops better and facilitate for impact. The first thing I'll do is I'll talk about the facilitation by design framework. This is something I teach in my master, uh, in my program, design mastery program. And what this will do is it'll help you decide what goes in and doesn't go into your workshop. It's, it's a time saver just to, to know what that framework looks like. Then we'll take look at how we can take a storytelling approach to craft your workshop. This is helping you construct a session like a journey where you're taking people from one place to another. And then the Spark facilitation structure, this is evidence-based, and this helps you fully engage your workshop attendees and guide them towards their insights. Um, as a side point, this will also help you with your workshop timing if you use it really well. So everything we I'm going to cover with you is all about helping you make sure that you're preparing for your workshop to go right. So every, you know, it's all about making sure everything's done so that you can feel confident in stepping into any room, whether it's a real room or a Zoom room. All right, so facilitation by design. What I tell my uh, program members is that great facilitation doesn't just happen. It's intentional and it's designed. So as I go through the framework, so there's a question about what is the double, yes, Spark, there's a double P, I will explain what the acronym is, Pablo, uh, in the chat, um, we'll, we'll get there. Um, do a little bit of suspense for now. Right, so facilitation by design. Um, when we think about facilitation, we often think about it being uh, something that we deliver. Now, this is one part of the facilitation by design framework, because that's the thing that most people see. That's the thing that we think that we're doing. We're facilitating, we're delivering. But to deliver a great workshop, you need to do the hard work to build it. And to build a great workshop, you've got to do the work to define the problem that you're solving and for who. Now, if you're like me and you're going to run a workshop, uh, your natural reaction might be to start jumping to what am I going to do? What activity should I do? Uh, you're, you're essentially jumping to the build phase. 
which is fine, but it is a little bit of jumping ahead. It's like the cart before the horse moment. So what I wanna do is take a moment to go through each of these phases, define, build and deliver, and show you how they interlink to create that facilitation by design kind of overlap. And as a heads up, I'm going to just focus a little bit more around the importance of the defined phase and especially the first step in that defined phase. So the defined phase. This is where you're getting really clear with what your workshop seeks to achieve and the tangible benefits for the people who are coming to your workshop. Now, I know that many of you here will have a set of human-centered design methods that you use in your workshop for your end user, your end beneficiary. So what I'm saying is nothing new, but ironically, what I often see is that while we typically are people-oriented and we care about the people coming to our workshop, we don't always take a people-centered approach to the people coming to our workshop. So this phase, this defined phase, you kind of want to be asking yourself, what's the value proposition for the people coming to the workshop? And this starts with the first step, where you choose the focus of your workshop. And this has to be, uh, it has to be rooted in understanding who's coming to your workshop, colleagues, stakeholders, clients, who's, who's coming there? And collectively, what problem are you solving? What pains do they have? What fears do they have? Uh, any anxieties? Or something that's not, not quite right <laughs> that you are running a workshop for to help them achieve towards some kind of goal, some kind of gain, a desire. Now, there's obviously a lot of people will have a lot of problems and pains and gains. You're not going to be able to address all of them, but you're going to have to choose a focus and start to think about where you're taking them from and where you're taking them to. This is the start of taking that transformation kind of approach to a workshop. And so when you've done that, uh, you can then move on to the next step where you unpack your expertise. This is where you're then looking at where people are at, where they're going and what's in the way. What barriers do they have? What challenges are there? And you're going through your toolkit, having a first pass of going, okay, well, this thing could help be helpful. Maybe it's a principle. Maybe it's some knowledge that they need, but you're trying to use your expertise to figure out what it is can help them get over that. More than likely, you're going to have way too many things that you want to do, and that's okay. <laughs> You're going to refine them down to describe, describe the, val the value of the workshop. This is the value proposition. So this is where you are identifying the tangible benefits for the people coming to your workshop. Now, I, I can give another talk on how you can describe this using objectives and outcomes and all that stuff. But the main thing I want to like leave you with at this point, which is really helpful to think about is, what do you want people to know? What do you want people to feel? And what do you want people to do or kind of create in your workshop that, and I'm going to use some color now, that ultimately helps them achieve that goal? So what do you want people to know, feel, and do, or create to get them there? Now, I know some of you might also want to think about what do you want to, to think? That's okay. That, add that. But I think knowledge and action is really important here to really describe the value, that tangible value. Now, having done this, this has serves two purposes. The first purpose is you can communicate the value of coming to your workshop so people have bought in before they come, come to you. And it serves as a good yardstick for you to decide what goes in and doesn't go into your workshop. It is your, your time saving. Uh, this is the thing that's going to save you time. Because now I'm going to I'm going to go through the rest of this in a little bit more with a bit more speed. Because 
once you know what you're going to try to achieve and for what reason, you can plan your experience. This is where you're sequencing the, the activities. I'm going to talk about that next. You'll be able to structure your workshop. This is where you're taking your, your plan um, and you're turning it into something a bit more uh, concrete. You're thinking about how many people are going to come, how long do you have, is it on Zoom or is it a remote session or in person? You're constructing the mechanics of the activities to fit into your time frame. You create your material. So that, oops, there's a little, my iPad slipped. You're creating the material. This is where you're making your presentations, your mirror boards, your murals, your worksheets, your templates, all those things happen there. And then when it comes to delivery, you're considering the impact that your workshop's going to have. It will be linked to the value. You're building your evaluation tools if you're going to use them. You're going to prepare for delivery, preparing yourself, preparing your co-facilitator, preparing with your client, if you're doing this with a client, the venue, and more importantly, preparing the audience, your attendees, to get the most out of the session. And again, you're going to be using something from Describe Value. And then finally, in the session, you're going to be managing group dynamics. Now, if you've gone through this whole process, you can see that when you're to manage group dynamics, you'll be able to use your insight around who's coming to your workshop to be able to meet your audience where they're at, understanding their realities. You'll be able to use what you've done in Describe Value to uh, help them appreciate why this is really important to them. You'll, you'll be taking, you'll be putting your plan into action, using the structure to deliver your workshop, as well as your material and all these things that helped you get there. Well, Ted, uh, could yes. I ask you a question and you can um, let me know if it's, uh, if you're gonna address it later or, but I feel like this is important between the build and the deliver. A lot of times people think that they can get things right first time around. Um, could you maybe talk about, or if you're gonna talk about the importance of iterating between build and deliver, that it's rare that you're gonna hit things right first time. So that inspect and adapt cycle. So um, I don't know yeah, if you're yeah, gonna yeah. that or if you're gonna discuss it later, but I think that's a very important piece. Of we can go to this, yeah, we can talk about it more in the, the Q and A actually, because I, I think what's important here is it's, it's this bit here, the yeah. ha, deciding how you're going to measure impact so that you can then use that at, at the end of the workshop to then iterate on what worked well and how you can improve it, like right. retrospectives and all that stuff. But yeah, I can speak to that later. Sounds good. Cool. So having kind of talked through this, this is what I mean about facilitation is both intentional and it's designed. You, you're not just going to show up uh, with a little bit of prep and get on with it. Maybe with enough experience, you can do that. Uh, but going through the process, even if it's like, even if it's uh, fast uh, and you're trying to do it quickly, it's still important to go through to go through the motions. So, having shared all of that, it's time to uh, share with you these two bits. Now, I'm going to talk about planning experience and structuring your workshop. That's the next two bits. So, when it comes to uh, your the storytelling approach. The big idea here that I want to share with you is treating your workshop like a story. I've already mentioned that you're taking people on a journey. Now, before I share this a bit more details about this, I'm going to make an assumption that all of you have a toolkit of exercises and activities, or you know where to go and find them. Now, if you don't get in touch with me, I've got like a list of places that you can find great tools. But with this assumption, the storytelling structure is all about how you pick and choose those activities to create that, that journey. So I, I, this is one of the things that I, I love the most uh, from uh, designing, so the, the creative bits. Um, 
I got this idea about seven years ago on a leadership program that I was on. And the big idea here is that you're going to think about your workshops like a story. Now, I'm going to talk through how that relates to how a story relates to a workshop one step at a time. Now, any story has a setup. This is the background information on the characters. You're setting the scene. You're priming the audience for the rest of the story. So in your workshop, this the characters are your attendees, right? <laughs> they are like the, the protagonists. And you're setting the scene using the context that you have about them, all the stuff that you learned here. Choose focus. So this is where you're introducing the topic, the focus area, and you're explaining why it's important to them. And you're also telling them what's going to happen for the rest of the workshop. And like I said, you can do a lot of this stuff before a workshop as well. Then you have the inciting incident in a story. This is the triggering event that puts all the main events of the story in motion. It's when the audience starts to see what the story is all about. So in a workshop, the purpose of the triggering event or this inciting incident is what I say is like you're dipping people into the context of the workshop. So if the setup is about telling or explaining the context, the inciting incident is about people feeling the context. So for example, if you're running a workshop on team creativity, you might kick things off with a creativity game. I don't know, something like having people spend one minute drawing as many unique things in a circle as they can, and then having a conversation about it afterwards. You know, um, who found it easy? Who found it hard? What was that about the time pressures of like trying to do that? And that really kind of gets people kind of feeling into that context of what you're going to probably explore in the workshop. But of course, it doesn't have to be too complicated. Some of the simplest ways of having an inciting incident is asking why a topic is important to their roles, for the project, or, or what do you want people to get out of the session? You're getting people to kind of relate the importance of this to their realities. So once you've done that, once the context has been set firmly, the next bit is rising action. Now, the rising action of the story is the successive plot developments. So in a workshop, this is the things that you do and has you make the audience do to help them gain insights, awareness, new knowledge, create new things and all that stuff. This is where you're sharing know-how and it's your activities. So in the, team in the team creativity workshop, you might be exploring um, principles behind creativity, recognizing what hinders creativity and what supports it. Maybe you're doing some ideation methods. All of this leading to a climax where everything comes together. It's a culmination of all the things that you've done and it has to be, you link this really strongly to the goal of the, that people want to achieve. It might not be the goal in the workshop, but it might support the goal. So in the team creativity thing, you might get them to do a creative brief that will help them achieve something in the project afterwards. And then finishing off the workshop, you, you've got, if you have the rising action, you now have the falling action. This is essentially where you're helping people integrate what they've done, integrate, what's happened in the rest of the workshop to their day-to-day -day realities. And then you have the resolution, which is just kind of finishing things off with your key points and telling people what's going to happen next. So this is the storytelling uh, approach of how you use a story to do what you do in a workshop. Now, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll wait for questions at the end, but, just to share with you now the Spark Facilitation Guide, the, the, the framework. This, if, if you imagine the workshop uh, narrative, the, the narrative arc that I shared with you is all about the whole workshop. 
What I'm sharing with you here, this is about the specific activities that you're going to run and making sure they go well. Because this particular structure is, uh, as Pablo was asking in, in the chat, it is a, it's an acronym that summarizes an intuitive way of running activities. Now, as a process, it incorporates experiential learning theory that ultimately helps people engage with the process and get the most out of the activities. And what you'll find is that if you skip a step, you'll find that you're working harder to get buy-in, pe getting people back on track or achieving the planned outcomes. And it's pretty straightforward. Like you'll see this and you'll go, this seems obvious. And, uh, and I, I want it to be obvious so that you can use it uh, in, in future. So the first thing is you're setting the scene, very similar to the entire workshop, but for an activity. This is when you're introducing what you're doing, could be the name of the activity, why you're doing it related to that big kind of context, or when if you're doing an activity, part, telling it as part of the story. This is where we were, this is where we're going, and this is what fits in between. And then how you're gonna do it. This is giving an, an overall, um, sense of what the activity will, how the activity will run. You're not giving instructions yet. You're just lightly sowing the seeds of the outcomes that you want. So as an example, let's say you're doing a, a it's a different example now, a, a values um, exercise, a values workshop with some emerging leaders. You might say something like, we're gonna do a values mining exercise. That's your what? It's important to know our core values so that we can make decisions and take action from a place of meaning. Why? To help us get clear with our values, we're going to work in small groups, take it in turns to share stories and help each other uncover what makes us tick. That's your how, right? So this is, should only take a couple of minutes. Then you don't always have to do the next piece, but presenting information. Is there something that you need to tell people before they get on with the activity that will help them. So in the, in the values ex example, it's maybe telling them what values, the definition of values, or some big idea or some big framework. What is it that you're, they need to know before they get on with the activity? And then you have provide instructions or provide guidance. This is when you are giving people clear instructions. and you're telling them how long they've got. Sometimes we forget to tell people how long they've got. <laughs> In your head, you've got like five minutes and people think they might have like 10 or 20 or whatever it is. Um, now, one top tip I will give you, if you're going to be working, if you're gonna get people to work in groups and maybe they need resources to get on with the activity, organize them first, so get people into the groups, make sure they've got their sticky notes and whatever they need, and then give them the instructions because then they can get on with the task at hand. Also, have your instructions somewhere visible, whether it's on a slide, on a handout, uh, on a mural or a mirror, just somewhere where people have access to it. So they, they know what they're doing and they bother you less. <laughs> but basically making sure that they, they get on with the activity, which is the next thing, which is activating the experience. You're just getting, letting people get on with things. And um, this is where you, um, you're essentially letting people get on with things, not conceptualize things. This is the activity. And then once they've done the activity, you want to reflect on the experience. Now, this is the debrief. I can give another talk on the importance of the debrief because oftentimes it's either skipped or it's rushed through, but it's a really important part of the process to help people make sense of the experience because they need to reflect on what's happened, make meaning from it so that they can apply what they've uncovered, they've learned, 
into their day-to-day -day realities. So a really easy way to help you to think about how to structure your debriefs, how to structure this reflection, is by first asking questions about how people experienced the, the activity. And it can be as simple as, how was that? Was it easy? Was it hard? Who found it challenging? Who found it enjoyable? Whatever it is, you just want to be hearing how it was. There's no right or wrong answer here. You're letting people ventilate how they felt, normalize any reaction, and essentially build that psychological safety to ultimately start asking people, what did they learn? Any insights? And again, this has to be to do with the no feel do's from the described value stage. So you'll be guiding the conversation to make sure that people are working towards uh, uncovering those intended outcomes. And then finally, as part of the debrief, it's about asking people how they will apply what they've done, what they've learned, any insights to their day-to-day -day reality. Going through this, maximize the chances of people joining the dots learning from each other and taking action afterwards. That's the impact that you want people to have so that they don't just have a great experience, they actually have a great experience that leads to something. And then finally, your key points. You're just summarizing what's, uh, what people have talked about here related to the point of the activity and the workshop. And a top tip here, use as much of the words that people use themselves in this part of the, of the reflection to validate their experience so that they feel good about themselves, but also just get that goodwill and, uh, and boost that, the, the, the impact that you have because people will feel that what they've done has been heard and understood. And then of course, then you can move on to the next activity. And what you'll probably find as the last point here is that if you have done your, um, your constructed your narrative really well don't be surprised if the things that people say here will naturally lead on to the next activity and so yeah there we go <clears throat> that is the uh, the three things that we covered the facilitation by design framework helps you uh, decide what goes in and doesn't go into your workshop especially the defined phase Storytelling approach helps you create that journey for that transformation. And the spark structure is all about making sure that all the great ideas that you got for your activities are executed for impact. So with that, I will pause and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Pat, this was awesome. You're welcome, awesome. thank you. All uh, my questions, let's see if people have. Uh... So what questions do you have for Pat? Uh, they're asking you if you could sc scroll back. Maybe. Yeah, and, and also I should have warned you, my handwriting is absolutely terrible. Uh, <laughs> where do you want to scroll back to? Here, storytelling approach. Okay, let's go to storytelling approach. I also, I, I've got uh, non-hand drawn versions of these as, as well. So I can share that with you, uh, Miljan, and uh, you can share it with everybody else. Sounds good, yeah. No, I'm planning to go back and just watch it again because I think it's... Uh... It's really good reminder of uh, of that structure and the importance also of storytelling. I think is uh... yeah, it's it helps you uh, as you go through the workshop and it, especially if you've got like a slide just sharing people where they are and the process is really like basic stuff. But you can really help people know that you're taking them through a process and um, you're not just doing things randomly. Um, but that, I think that's really important to show the continuity. Um, okay, spark structure, here you go. Um, um, yeah, so C Catherine's point is really good. So I would say this, the spark structure, you would be 
for every activity, you will want to set the scene. You don't always have to present information, but you will have to give guidance, give people a chance to do things. With the reflection, you don't always have to ask how they'll apply it. If you've got a series of activities, you might just save the apply in that final debrief at the end. Uh, but again, like some key points at the end of each activity, just to sort of wrap things up is always good. Uh, so what else have we got? Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, glad you enjoyed it, the storytelling approach. I mean, could we go back to, I don't know, you can check the questions, like Tosin's question. Oh, yeah. Tosin, you can elaborate a little bit. I don't know what you mean by, or maybe I, if you do, to, uh, Pad. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you mean by method? Uh, I mean approach which which of the um, approaches are your favorite um, and why um, in terms of again is it the spark is it the storytelling or is it frustration by design which one of them do you prefer or do you um, use the most and why yeah good question so I use all of them so every single every single thing so sort of fits into here so Whenever I design any workshops, I will go through the facilitation by design methodology step by step. And so, and, and as part of those steps, I kind of went, did a bit of a deep dive around the plan experience, which is the storytelling approach, and a structure workshop, which is Spark. I can't live without them, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I've got no, no favorites, they just work together. Another one that's similar to Spark is Four Cs. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Um, the Collect? Well, it, it's uh, like, uh, I'll put the PDF in the chat. Um, is it the AJ and Spark Four Cs? Uh, I don't, uh, let me drop it in and then you guys, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, collect, choose, create. Yeah, so actually, interestingly oh, enough, cool. thanks, David. It's yeah, great. yeah, no, so you know, this thing here, um, you can think about, you can map a whole bunch of different things uh, to the storytelling approach. So uh, I'd say Spark is like, it's the backbone of like facilitating a specific activity, whereas collect, choose, create, commit, they, you have, um, specific those are like specific activities that you can basically use spark to facilitate you know like a, a crazy eights for example you would set up crazy eights you know we're going to do an activity called crazy eights and the reason why we're going to do this is da, 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 da. but one thing which you could do in a way is think about on a project in a design sprint or whatever you can be you you can have collect Choose, create, commit. That is like the flow of how you could do that. Now, of course, like you can have a specific workshop that is just on collect. And again, you would like think about what the, the, the narrative arc is for just your collect workshop. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the flow. One thing which I think is uh, like missing from this is that there's no just in terms of how I've just shown it there's there's no kind of set like way of kind of meeting people where they're at necessarily and the kind of collect choose create that you sort of do that whereas if you're doing other workshops like um, like a coaching like a team coaching workshop so I'm, I'm trained with like as a systems coach organization relationship and systems coach through um, CRR you might want to do meet people where they're at that's sort of the beginning then the rising action is reveal so you're revealing the system to itself like how it all kind of interplays with each other then you at this point for the climax you would align the team to sort of making sure like the everything that sort of came up in the reveal they kind of processed it they're aligning and then they're they're taking action so there's a lot of different and there's a few other Things, ways you can think about this for other types of workshops like skill development workshops but essentially there is a way of mapping a process 
um, to that. So essentially, you know, this stuff that I kind of shared here, just kind of what you do in the workshop can map against the storytelling framework. Yeah, Shaquille, that's what I, yeah. So uh, what, uh, Benoit, you, you had your hand up for a while. Um, what question do you have? It's okay. Hey, Pat, how are you? Hey, Benoit, good to see you again. Yeah, yes. it's been a while. Um, yeah, it is. Was uh, a love of presentation, really nice. Uh, the organization I love. I'm more of a foresty guy, as you know, the, the other gang. <clears throat> but I do like the setup that you put on, and definitely the storytelling. Uh, there's more information beforehand, and I love that proposition that that you prepare better with the storytelling and the arc that you go through. So that's that's a big plus for me. I think it's it's both in the spark and, and on the on the storytelling, but I think it's a big plus with with your uh, way of thinking. So I love that. Uh, I was the one thing that I'm thinking about that maybe could be a problem, at least for me, is the time, the time to actually go through and explain that. And I, I'm a little uh, afraid that it would mean more time per uh, activities because you explain it better. But then again, it takes more time on your part, the facilitator. I don't know if it makes sense, but. Uh, yeah, no, that makes sense. So, you know, um, set, so setting the scene here, you probably only want to spend a couple of minutes setting the scene. Again, it depends on um, what it is that you need and how long you've got. So I'm not saying that you've got to spend a long time explaining any particular thing, but you've got to give enough information for people to be able to successfully get on with the activity. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you if you don't do it, they'll get lost, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I'd say as well is, I mentioned this at the beginning, if you think about Spark, if you're well prepared with all of these things, you can imagine with yourself, like how long will it take me to explain the what, why, and the how? How long will it take for me to present the, like, present the information? How complex is the task and how can I maybe make it easier, maybe giving them a template that might make them do it a lot quicker rather than me explaining it. So it actually helps you plan your timings better. Um, and then you won't be overrunning because that's another thing that often happens. We run out of time. We think we're gonna do a 10 minute activity. We put 10 minutes in our plan. Actually, it took us seven minutes to explain it. So it, this spark is another way of like uh, giving, helping us go through the motions of what it actually takes to design a workshop, uh, to, 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 to facilitate an activity in a workshop. Excellent point. Thanks. Through how many iterations do you typically go where you you feel like, let's just say you have a topic or a module that you want to introduce? Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, good question. You don't get so, it right so, from time, which goes back to my earlier question. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's like, I, know I remember your earlier question. Yeah, Milja, that's a good point. You know, it depends. Uh, I, I think of it like this. Sometimes, quite a lot of the work I've done has been bespoke um, workshops. So that they have a client, there's a brief, we explore the brief, we define the problem, and then we design a solution of, for, as a workshop and deliver it just that once. And now within that, within the de development process, depending on the scope of the project, we might do a little bit of uh, iterating between colleagues and or the client, like the direct client, where we're kind of just stress testing some of the activities um, different from if you're maybe creating a product, a, a workshop that's a product, um, and then there, I mean, it, it's endless, right? You know, you you want to like keep on refining that the, the workshop to so that it's slick. You know what you're saying. You know the pitfalls. You know where people might get lost and how you can support them to to navigate that either in the setup wow. or during the activity. So yeah, it's. It's not quite answering your question because it depends, but yeah, that, that's how I think about it. Yeah, no, I think it, it, I guess the point uh, in, that I want to reiterate is if you've never designed a workshop or you're facilitating, it's uh, it's a constant inspect and adapt, and you're always looking for ways to improve it. Yeah, thinking that you're and, gonna you know, one thing which I would say as well is following the structure. I call it facilitation by design. Like, notice I haven't talked about being in the room managing group dynamics in this talk. I've been 
focusing on what is it that you can do in preparation of that so that you're doing everything you can to make things go right. <laughs> and so instead of the worrying, have I got enough time or should I jump this activity? You've kind of done the work beforehand. And of course, to your point, Miljan, things don't always go to plan and you're going to learn things. So this is where I also um, haven't talked about it here, but measures of impact. Um, it's about being really clear about what it is that you want to know um, from an ex part, like attendee experience, attendee learning and attendee impact uh, that you've kind of identified here that you can then just check either directly in the workshop because they've either done these things or not, or you ask them afterwards or you ask them at the end or you track how things have gone. And then those things will ultimately help you better understand who your workshop's for, the pain points and the gain points, and then you go around the process again. You're basically iterating your, 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 your craft because you're getting better at the starting point. Exactly. Thank you. Um, any last questions? Anything else before we take a break here? Not a question, but I feel compelled to share just how mind blowing it is, right? Like having the structure to, because I, I, and I hadn't even thought about my tendency to rely on the I'm good with people part to kind of be on the fly. It's like no matter what happens, it's going to be okay because I know I'm good with people, but it's stressful facilitating from that position. And so this has been mind blowing about how to set things up to do less of the heavy lifting and more of being present in the moment. Amazing. I'm so glad that you've, you've, uh, you've got that as a benefit from this. I'm yeah, it's, it's it makes me happy. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that as well. Um, and of course, if any, you know, the, I said this at the beginning, please feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn. And if you are interested in finding out about how we can work with each other as well, I've got uh, a, the workshop design mastery program starting in the third week of March. So we can give you more information about that, have a chat, see if it fits with what you're looking for and uh, if it's matches up with your goals and uh, where you want to develop. So yeah. And if anybody wants to chat with me about that, 